um, let's get started. Um, so my name is G. Uh, I'm from Twitter. Today I'm going to talk about uh, per container network monitoring and isolation in Mesos. So what I'm going to talk about is the building network isolator in Mesos codebase today. I mean, it's from Mesos 021. And uh, we've been using this um, network isolator in our production environment for a few quarters, so it's super stable. So you can enable um, that isolator by specifying uh, <coughs> the isolation flag network poor mapping. It has several features like the uh, per container network statistics and per container network namespace, and also has some form of network isolation, including bandwidth capping and uh, some flow control. So I'm going to jump into the detail of those um, features later. So this is the outline of my talk. So I'm going to first go through um, the networking problem in Mesos um, before this isolator exists. And then, um, and then I'm going to talk about when should we use that isolator. So we build this isolator um, based on some of the design constraints we have internally at Twitter. So um, it's better to, for you guys to understand like, what's the implication of uh, using this uh, network isolator and uh, at which moment should you use it. And then I'm going to go through the implementation and then uh, going to go through how to deploy that isolator in production and uh, share you some experience um, that we have uh, in using it at Twitter. So the problem, networking problem in Meso. So prior to 0.21, um, all tasks and executors running on a Mesos agent share the same host network. That caused like three problems I can think of. One is the monitoring problem, the other one is the isolation and the debugging problem. So problem number one, monitoring. So uh, we usually get questions like this before um, that isolator is deployed to production. So how can I get the uh, Rx by per second for my uh, container? Um, the answer is at the time is like, oh, we can only get you the host level network statistics, and, uh, um, but there could be multiple containers running on the host level, so that statistics is not usually quite useful. So the second problem is isolation. So all tasks share the same host network, and that means like, it can cause contention on bandwidth, ports, and uh, on TXQs, like that affect latency. Um, just give you some examples. Say you have two containers running on the same Mesos host. Um, so one container um, making a lot of connections, like say 10 to the power of six connections to some servers. And then like you have another container trying to, to call a bind zero, and that can fail because the, the, the container number one used all the free ports on, on that host. So that's kind of the isolation problem we have. So if you think about the isolation problem, you can um, um, classify the isolation problem into two major categories. The first category, I call it network stack isolation. So people want separate um, ports, IP tables, TC filters, routing tables for their containers. Um, the other one, the other isolation problem, I call it performance isolation, bandwidth isolation, latency isolation. So there are two kind of isolation problems here. The number three problem is for debugging. So we, we usually get those questions like, how do we do this for my container, like um, modify the IP table to simulate network failures, or like modify TC filter to uh, simulate uh, a slow network, or like run TCP dump or NASDAQ just for my contain containers, not all the other uh, host services. So, okay, so we have a bunch of solutions to address the above problems. Um, then the question is, when should I use um, this isolator? So um, I think they're like, I, I want to mention like, if you want to use this isolator, if you're using Mesos Containerizer, so it's only for you Mesos Containerizer, and you want to use this isolator if you do not have enough routable IP in your data center. So you don't have enough IP to support IP per container, uh, or like even if you have enough IP for IP for container, IP per container, the IP asset, like assignment needs to um, talk to some global services and that needs global knowledge because right now Mesos does not support a, a notion called global resources, so it's, it's, it's not easy to do that. So if you have those limitations, you might consider using this isolator. And also like if you have some, uh, you have some requirement like you don't want the application to change, especially the service discovery mechanism. You don't want those things to change. So if you have those, um, listed things, then you might want to consider using this isolator. Um, so a standard approach on Linux to do uh, network isolation and monitoring is like you run each um, container in a separate network namespace and assign uh, a separate IP to each container. And then connect those containers using a, a, a Mac VLAN bridge, for example. Um, 
but the problem for that is you don't have enough those IPs, routable IPs for each container, and you don't want to change the service discovery mechanism, so it's not a, a, a solution for us. So in fact, in our um, environment, we come up with this solution. So we, we still use na uh, Linux network namespaces, so each container has its own separate network stack. That's pretty good. And uh, so since we don't have IP to multiplex packages to individual containers, we use ports to do that. So we multiplexing packages using ports. So all the containers on the same host share the same host IP. So we only have one IP. And the host ports are uh, divided into a few disjoint subsets. And each container gets assigned a, a single subset. And then we're going to install some rules on the host network to redirect those packages according to source and destination ports. I'm going to explain those in details. So this is the architecture of our solution. So as I mentioned, like each container still runs under its own network namespace. And uh, um, so all the containers share the same IP. If you look at the IP here, um, they all are the same IP. And then on the host ETH0, like the, the network link, we install some um, traffic control rules, TC rules. And I'm going I'm to explain those TC control rules in details later. But just imagine you have some TC control rules on the host network, and also you have some TC control rule inside container. And by installing those traffic controls, and we're going to redirect and mirror IP packages based on port ranges um, to properly redirect packages to the corresponding container. So that's the overall architecture uh, of this approach. So it's based on port mapping. So say you have a you have a um, incoming package which has a destination port uh, 354500, and uh, as I mentioned, each container gets assigned a subset of the host port range. In this case, like container one gets assigned 32000 to 33000, um, and uh, based on the the mapping, so we use a direct mapping. So based on the mapping, uh, we will redirect that package to container three. So that package is actually for container three, not other containers. So the mapping is actually a direct mapping. So the port on the host is a port inside the container. This is for simplicity and uh, uh, a service discovery, transparent to service discovery. So uh, now I'm going to go through those traffic control details. How do we route those packages? Actually, you can uh, think about the problem uh, as these three, four, uh, sorry, four sub-problems. How do you uh, route packages from container to uh, external, external, I mean, a different host? And how do I redirect packages um, between containers, like say two containers on the same host wants to talk to each other. You want, you want to redirect the package properly so that one package can reach the other container. And how do you deal with the, contain, the, the connection between the container and the host services? Like you have a name D running on the host. You want to talk to that uh, service on the host. And also, uh, there's some special rules for ICMP and R packages. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through details. So that's how we do. So what we the traffic control we, do, we, we modify, actually we add the traffic control on ingress queue disk. So most of the queue traffic control are installed on egress queue disk. Um, but um, for this one, we install on ingress queue disk. And uh, we bypass all the NAT filters uh, in Linux. And because that, that's mainly for performance reason, because NAT filter, has, it's a very complex flow. If you see this graph here, I copy from somewhere, like, it goes through a lot of stages in NAT filters. So what we do is we just bypass all these net filter thing in the Linux kernel, and we install QDisk, and the QDisk can allow you to redirect package accordingly um, to some um, corresponding container based on port ranges. So that's what we do. So it turns out that the performance is pretty good by doing this. Okay, so I'm going to talk about first, like how do we uh, redirect a package from um, uh, external? Like say you have a package coming from an external host to the container. Say you have a package come in and the destination port is uh, 33500, and that belongs to container two. So on the, on the host each at zero, we have a, a TC control rule like this. So if the port range, if the destination port is within this range, redirect the package to VETH1, and if the host port range, if the port range is, if the port destination port belongs to this range, redirect to VETH2. So in this case, uh, it belongs to container two, so that package will be redirected to container two. So now the container to external traffic. So say you have a, a package you want to send out uh, in container two, and the destination IP is external. External here, I mean like it's not the same as the IP used by this container. 
So we have certain rule on the host each is zero on TC, uh, on Q, ingress Q disk, basically saying if the destination IP um, is external, that will be redirect to, sorry, uh, sorry. So, so we have some TC rule on VETH. So if so the package will be sent to ETH zero and go to this, go through this pipe and go to and, and go through VETH two. On the VETH two, we have a rule called I like, say if the destination IP is external, w that package will be redirect to the host ETH zero. So that package will flow like this. So now, uh, how do we deal with like communication between containers? Say we have a package. The destination IP is local, the same IP as the current container. And the destination port is this, and that one belongs to an, a different container. So what we do here is we install some TC inside a container, TC rule inside a container as well. So basically in this case, uh, we have some rule like if the, port, if the destination port is not belong to this container, that will be redirect to the, the ETH zero inside the container, and that will go through the pipe. And on the host, on the host VETH, we're gonna check whether the destination IP is local or not. If it's local, it will be redirected to the loopback um, on the host. And there's some rule on the loopback as well. So if, yeah, it's complicated, but. So, so on the loopback, you, you, you also have some rules. Say, hey, if the destination port belongs to container one, it will be redirected to VETH one, otherwise redirected to VETH two. I mean, if it doesn't match, it will be sent to the host. So in this case, um, that destination port belongs to container one, so it will be redirect like this. So go through loopback, each is zero, go through the pipe, go to host loopback, and go back to VETH one, and then go to that container. So that's how we deal with container to container communication. But as I mentioned, like this is a rare case because like most of the case, uh, a container talk to some services outside the same Mesos agent, Mesos node. Okay, so there are some special cases for uh, ICMP and ARP. The main reason is because for ICMP and ARP packages, there's no ports, right? So we need to deal with those because we need to still want the ping to work, for example. Um, so that's what we do. Say a container um, ping an external host. So there's a ping uh, ICMP packages. So we have certain rule on VETH here. Say, hey, if it's ARP or ICMP and the destination IP is external, it will be redirect to ETH zero. And then we have some rule on host ETH zero, say, hey, if there's some ARP and ICMP packages come in, and there will be, that package will be mirrored to all the VETH and will be sent to all the containers. So essentially it's like this. You ping an external host, and the external host reply with a ping response, and that response will be redirect to all the containers, so that one will receive a ping response. Um, so that has a, a side effect. That means like when you ping, you receive, like the other container might receive uh, duplicated ping messages. So for example, all, all like say if you ping a container from external and every single container is gonna respond with the ping reply, that means like you're gonna get duplicated ping. But I think that's not a problem for us and I, I think that's a very easy way to figure out how many containers on the slave. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so, so we have, we, we also do some performance isolation, uh, so including bandwidth isolation and latency isolation. So for, for bandwidth isolation, we introduce some notion called container bandwidth capping. So we, allow, we have, a, like, have a cap on the egress traffic. Like, so that, like, the reason we introduce bandwidth capping is prevent, from one, prevent one container from use up all the bandwidth of the entire host. And we have some latency isolation as well. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that uh, in a few slides. So the container bandwidth capping, so we impose a max rate cap on egress traffic. And we leverage the HTB code that's already existing in Linux kernel. So that's the command we run inside the container. So basically what we, what we do is we install an HTB code disk, egress code disk on, on, on ETH0 inside the container. And there's only one HTB class. And you can set a rate on this class, say, hey, 300 megabits. And then uh, we use a leave code disk, FQ code out. So um, that's pretty standard in Linux. So that's what we do for the bandwidth capping. And the unique flow for uh, each container, um, that's something we do for the latency isolation. So why we, why we need this? Because right now, like multiple containers share the same TXQ on the host. And uh, that causes potential buffer load problem because one container can send a lot of packages, even if we have bandwidth capping, but it can still flow, uh, flood the um, TXQ. So what we do here is we leverage the F, like, 
FQ code out QDisk for your queuing control delay. And using this QDisk, you can specify a, a separate virtual flows. And we can use one virtual flow for each container so that like, um, it can improve the latency for the container. So the implementation is, uh, it's implemented as a pluggable isolator for Mesos containerizer. It's composable with any other con isolators uh, uh, in the code base. Um, it's, it manages TC rules using a library called LibNow, basically a wrapper over NetLink messages. Now I'm gonna talk about how do we deploy this because deploy is not uh, as easy as uh, other isolators. So there's some rec requirements on, 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 on this isolator. So you have to use a kernel new enough so it has to be uh, greater or equals to 3.16, or you want or you want to use the old kernel, but you want to make sure to backport a few patches to your old kernel, uh, and that list is on the uh, user doc. And you want to use the latest LibNow release, 3.2.26, and that's the only two requirements. So how to build it? So so you want to install LibNow, um, most likely from source, because I know like most of the Linux distribution don't have the latest release. Uh, for Libon now, so you may want to build it from source. And then when you config and build Mesos, you need to specify with now or isolator and with Libon now pass to the installed Libon now. So that's what you need to do. It's not building uh, by default. The now isolator is not building by default. You have to explicitly specify that. And you have to do something to config network ports. So I'm going to talk about like there are like two type of ports, one is called ephemeral e ports, and the other one is non ephemeral ports. So ephemeral ports are short-lived ports used for communication. It's allocated by kernel automatically, and then you can config the range um, by, by, by setting a proc file like net IPv4 IP local port range, you can specify that. And the non ephemeral ports is usually for listening ports, and it's allocated and managed by Mesos, like, like, by Mesos like other, any other like resources like CPU and memory. So you need to um, set up the host so that like, there's like, no overlap port ranges for host services in the Mesos containerizer. As I mentioned, this solution used port mapping to read multiplex packages to different containers. So we divide the host ports into different chunks. So you have to make sure um, they don't overlap. So this is how a typical setting is. So you want to make sure like, host services only use non ephemeral port from 0 to 10,000 and the ephemeral port from 10,000 to 31,000. And for Mesos containers and the non ephemeral ports for Mesos container from this, like 31,000 to 32,000, and the rest is the ephemeral ports for containers. And the ephemeral ports per container, like we currently, the default is like there's 1,024 ephemeral ports for each container. So if you're putting all these together, so you start a Mesos slave, uh, specify the isolation flag to be network port mapping, and specify the resource, you specify the ports, which is the main ephemeral ports managed by, uh, say, Aurora. And then you have ephemeral ports, which is the, which is the uh, ephemeral ports used by each container. That resource is not currently exposed to the framework, so it's managed by the slave. And then you specify how many ports you want, how many ephemeral ports you want to use for each container. And then you have those uh, flow control and the bandwidth capping features. You can set a rate limit for each container. What's the maximum um, bandwidth for each container? All these are configurable. You can remove those flags if you want. So, okay, so once you, re once you do that, and then you can get the network stats from um, the monitor statistic.json endpoints, and you can get the Rx bytes, Rx drop, Tx byte, Tx drop, and if you hook up with your own monitoring system, you can get a nice graph showing like what's the network usage of your own content, of your container. So there are some limitations. So first of all, we have limited ephemeral ports per container um, because we, we only use, we use port ranges, we use ports to multiplex um, those packages. So we have to divide the host port range into s small chunks. That's a limitation we cannot avoid. Um, but most, most of the case, like this is not an issue in production. And uh, we have duplicate ICMP in our packages. As I mentioned earlier, like you, you get duplicate response if you do ping. And there's some performance impact as well, but um, like because you have additional hops for each packages, and there's some log contention on ingress QDisk in the kernel. Um, but I mean, from our experience, there's like performance is okay for, um, for our traffic. So I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just share some experience we have here at Twitter to uh, like using this isolator. So it has been used for a few quarters now, so it's super stable. 
um, and we have very few issues encountered when rolling out this on our isolator. So most, most of the issues co are caused by application bugs in using ports. So I'll give you some um, case studies. So for example, like one case is like uh, someone, uh, someone complained like some Mesos tasks have, have ports blocked. Turns out that they hard code some non informal port in their code. Um, like say 80 or like 1024. And uh, previously, um, so the bind will succeed inside the container namespace because each container has its own namespace. The bind will succeed, but it will not get any traffic because that port is not part of the port assigned to that container. So the traffic won't be redirected to that container. So the solution to that is you have to request ports from a scheduler like Aurora. So the other case we have is uh, some, someone complained like some encryption tests running in a task are flaky. Turns out that like they try to find a free port to use for local service ports. Like they just want to call bind zero, but they don't call bind zero. They just call bind 1024. If, it's, if it fails, try, try the next port, try the next port, and uh, um, try to find a free port to listen on. But that turns out that code is totally buggy, so you should not use that. If you want a, a listening port, just call bind zero to get a port. So another case is like we got address already in use when making some sensors got this error when making connections. Turns out like they're making a lot of short lived connection to a service IP column port to a sing, same service. And uh, they close the connection before making a new one. So they thought like they are, they are okay because they just maintain one connection at a time. But turns out like TCP has this time wait. So when you close the connection, that socket is still there for like two minutes. So it will run out of informal ports pretty quickly. So, so the solution to that is to ask them to use, either use one connection or really limit the connections. All right, so that's pretty much my talk. So the summary is like, consider using this network isolator if you don't have enough routable IPs and you need application transparency like service discovery. And to run this, you have to have a pretty new kernel and uh, install the latest 11 now 3. And that's it, thanks. Oh, sorry. I uh, have some acknowledgement. Um, so thanks to all these guys from Twitter to working on this project and all, all, the, all, all of them who participate in this discussion. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, any questions? Yeah, so the question is like, is it possible to ex like, uh, expose bandwidth as a resource so that like, uh, each container can decide it's like the bandwidth cap, for example? Uh, yeah, totally. So um, one thing we need to solve um, this problem is like, um, for bandwidth, pretty much you need to use over-subscription over because like, you cannot say, hey, the bandwidth uh, is uh, 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 disjoint the resources. Like, one, if one use half the bandwidth, the other one can only use the other half. That's not usually the case because you have those overlapping. So, so we may want to like, collaborate that with the over-subscription work um, to, to expose that resources. Yeah, I think that's a valid question. Which one? Or is that handled? Um, yeah, that slide there. How, how was the um, like? How do you avoid exhausting all the source ports? Exhausting. If, if, if you um, if you make sixty-five thousand connections out. Oh yeah. So. Um, how do you? Uh, one container does that. It exhausts it for the other container. No, they use separate network namespace. So as I mentioned, like so, each container has its own network namespace. So a network namespace means like all the ports are available in that network namespace. They won't like one container cannot affect other containers. I say if one container exhausts all the ports, that won't affect any other containers because they use separate network namespace. Uh, but on the outbound, there's only so many. So, uh, how's the separation? It only gets a certain amount. Yeah. Yeah. So then it can only make that set number of. Uh, yeah. So 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 basically, what we have is like you you divide the whole port range into a few subsets. So that's for inbound and outbound. Yes. For both. Okay. Yeah, for both.
Uh-huh. Um, have there been any ideas about utilizing the mechanisms in their like slow scheduling or having back pressure like ECN? Yes. Yeah, so um, so I think this is just a start. Like we can build all these mechanisms. Um, this is the infrastructure we build that's necessary for all these features. So we have to build this first. And also we use this solution because like we have those internal constraints. We cannot use an arbitrary network solution, say um, Catechol or those things. We don't. We simply don't just have enough routable IPs. So um, this this is kind of a very special solution that's suitable for our environment. But we are certainly investigating those. Uh, and more solutions. And have you done any research on, on flow scheduling and using MESA to schedule flows? Um, not yet. Yeah, I will, be I will be happy to talk with, with you about this after that. So, uh, two questions. One real quick the bandwidth cap. Is it saying that are those soft as in if some other computers are not using it, would you allow to use more? It's hard cap. Okay, it is. Yeah, it's a hard cap. It's, so, I, I can tell you it's a one third of the link speed currently. It's a hard cap, so no one can exceed that one. But if no one is using any bandwidth, they cannot go, to, go beyond that as well. As I mentioned, we probably want to use over subscription to deal with that bandwidth problem. Because if no one is using those bandwidths, probably like some other container can use about all the bandwidth to speed up their applications. Okay, I see. The question is, how do we uh, maintain those state uh, for those port ranges? So the solution is, we actually we just parse the uh, the TC rules on this VETH because there's only there's a one-on-one -on -one mapping between a VETH and a container, right? So we just list all the VETH on us on the host network, and we can parse the TC rules. And you can by parsing the TC rule, you can get those port ranges. So that's how we recover those port ranges. Um, after a slave crash or like uh, there's some churn in the network, something like that. Um, two questions. So this is very interesting work, but there are very mature SDM solutions that solve this and even beyond. So my question is, you haven't used them because you didn't do things like Docker to use your own isolation, or they didn't suit your needs? Yeah, I, uh, so we have a bunch of the constraints. So first of all, we cannot change the um, the application. So service discovery has, cannot be changed. You cannot use NAT. Because if you use NAT, you're going to publish your IP as a private IP. That IP is not routable, so the other container cannot just use the IP to connect to that service. So we cannot use NAT. And as I mentioned, we don't have enough routable IPs for each container. So each container don't have enough. So we don't have IP per container. So that's the reason we come up with this solution, so that every single container on the host share the same IP, so that we don't need to worry about the IP problem and the multiplexing the packages using ports. So that's, that's pretty much like we have those constraints, and that's the solution, best, best solution we can come up, come up with. But have you have, have, have evaluated any SDM solutions out there, or is it? Um, not yet. Um, yeah, but we will. What module? What do you mean by module? Yeah, so there's a list on the user doc. We have a link to that specific patch. I think some patches about, like, say, for example, there's one patch in uh, Linux 3.15. Before 3.15, you cannot set the MAC address of a loopback device. So we have, we have to get those patch into the, the Linux kernel uh, you run so that we can use this solution. Can you, can you see me? I cannot hear you. Uh, yeah, there's a list actually. You can go to. Um, yeah, so I have a link here. If you go to the doc, so these are the four patches you need. Yeah, so these are the four patches you need. So the latest one is in 3.15, so if you're using 3.16, it should be okay. Any other questions? All right, thanks for attending. Thank you very much. <laughs>